Hey, did you see the big news this week that the Federal Reserve announced its intentions to slow or taper its bond purchases effective immediately? Well, to understand the significance, first of all, you have to comprehend what the bond purchases were meant to do in the first place. We're going to spend a few minutes today talking about the mechanics of the Fed's bond purchases and how they affect interest rates. Stick around. So over the course of 2021, Wall Street's really been obsessing over the pace of bond purchases by the Federal Reserve, specifically when that pace is going to slow. But as a result, I've had a lot of inquiries. People have asked me to create a video about the mechanics of bond purchases and how they affect interest rates. And to be honest, I've had to spend a lot of time thinking about how to explain this in simple terms because you really need some foundational knowledge to comprehend the broader concept. So we really need to start with kind of two sub-concepts, uh, the first being the risk-free rate of return, and the second, how debt pricing works in the investment world. So actually, let's take those in reverse, starting with how debt is priced. Now, a large percentage of loans originated by banks are sold to investors, and you may have experienced this yourself if you've ever taken out a mortgage, and a few months after you close, you get a notification that says, hey, your loan's been sold. What it doesn't say on there is the price that the loan was sold for. Now, the way debt is priced and how pricing affects yields or effective interest rates can be confusing because it's a bit counterintuitive. And so can some of the language. So for, for instance, I just said yields or effective interest rates. I'm gonna use those phrases or words kind of interchangeably, so I'll try to clarify as much as possible. But I want to start out with an example. Uh, Let's just say a bank makes a loan for a million dollars to someone who wants to buy a commercial property. And again, just for the sake of simplicity, let's assume that this loan has a one-year term. Now let's also assume, like we talked about before, that this loan is ultimately sold to investors. So, for instance, let's say the loan in this top scenario is sold to an investor for a million dollars. So the loan, the face value of the loan is a million bucks and the investor pays a million bucks to the bank for it. Well, how does that work out? Well, the investor is going to get 5% of the million dollar face value or 50,000 bucks. So ultimately, they're going to end up with a 5% total return. Now, This is where it can get confusing. There are good reasons why an investor might sometimes be willing to pay a premium for a loan. So for instance, let's look at this this second scenario where an investor pays a million twenty thousand dollars for a loan that is only going to pay back a million dollars at maturity. Well, they're still going to earn their fifty thousand dollars, the five percent of the million dollar loan principal. So we can do the math and calculate that even though the investor paid a premium for the loan, the interest payment, again, is still high enough where the investor is gonna end up with a positive return or a positive yield. So the most important point here to understand is that when the price of debt increases, the yield or effective interest rate goes down. Again, take a look up here. When the price of the debt then this loan is million dollars face value if someone pays a premium i.e the price goes up that means the effective interest rate or the yield goes down so think about this in the context of the federal reserve buying bonds if they want interest rates to go down what is their objective they need the prices of bonds to go up This is the mechanics that you have to understand to to comprehend the whole bond buying concept. So we talked about the mechanics of debt pricing. When the price of debt goes up, interest rates go down and vice versa. And this also gets confusing because we're not, when I say price of debt, I'm not talking about the borrowing cost. I'm talking about the price of debt to an investor purchasing a debt security. Sorry for the jargon, it's difficult. Let's pivot and talk about the concept of the so-called risk-free rate of return. In the lending market, loans are basically all priced off some benchmark interest rate. And generally speaking, US government debt or bonds are generally considered risk-free. Therefore, everything, generally speaking, is priced off the current interest rate 
being paid on government debt. So for example, if the current yield on US government debt is 3%, well, a very creditworthy company such as Apple could likely borrow money at a slightly higher rate, say 3.5%. A company considered more risky may have to pay 5% and so forth. And you can see this, the stuff's published daily in publications like the Wall Street Journal. Uh, here's a snippet out of today's Wall Street Journal listing some key benchmark interest rates. And this top one, let's just use this as a proxy for government borrowing costs. And that's not quite accurate, but this illustrates my point. Uh, right now, this benchmark interest rate, the effective yield is 1.53%, okay? So again, let's just assume that's what the government has to pay. We can go down here to corporates, corporate debt or the borrowing cost for businesses, and a double A rated company, which would be a highly rated company, can borrow money today in the market at about 1.9%. In contrast, a triple B rated company, which is a lower grade company, has to pay 2.4% and so forth. So this is an exact example of what we're talking about. So let's tie this all together. If the Federal Reserve wants to provide support for the economy via lower interest rate, what does it need to do? Well, conceptually, it needs to bring the effective interest rate on U.S. Treasury debt down because, again, as we illustrated, everything is benchmarked off this. So if the Fed, for instance, pushed government borrowing costs down to 1%, you know, and then a company like Apple, for example, probably can borrow money at one and a half percent. And the riskier company, uh, instead of paying, say, five percent, might be able to now borrow at three percent. And of course, the same effect plays through uh, with consumers on mortgages, car loans, and so forth. Now, mechanically, how does the Fed push rates down? Well, if we go back to our example, remember, if the price of debt goes up. The effective yield or interest rate goes down. So if someone like the Federal Reserve wants the price of debt or any asset for that matter to increase, they have to increase demand or in other words, they have to start buying. And buying is exactly what the Federal Reserve has been doing. In fact, since June of 2020, the Federal Reserve has been buying $120 billion worth of bonds every single month, again, in an effort to push prices up, especially across government bonds, which serve as that risk-free rate or that benchmark rate. By pushing those prices up, it pushes interest rates down on that key benchmark rate, and that reverberates across the entire lending, the, the entire lending market and ultimately helps the economy as borrowing costs for everybody go down. Wow, we made it through. This was a really difficult one to try to explain with as little financial jargon, trying to narrow it down from a time perspective as well. But if the content made sense to you, uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for making it through. Please give me a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button. Uh, if you have questions or suggestions for other topics to discuss, you know, feel free to drop me a comment or you can get a hold of me via these other sources. I'm also on LinkedIn. I have to throw that up here as well. As always, thanks for watching. I hope we'll see you next time.